The Subaru Outback is in a unique position. It's one of the only new wagons left on the market. And if you ask me, this is the value king SUV in the Subaru lineup. But both of those things are probably going to change here very soon. Subaru is, to this day, very good at making rugged, comfortable crossovers. I don't see them messing that up with an upcoming Outback redesign. However, following a dealer event, there's been quite a bit of speculation and rumors that the new model will not have the same wagon appeal as the current one. So the first reason why I would buy a 2025 is because it still has this iconic form factor. Why does this matter? Well, first, it allows you to still have good ground clearance as this is lifted, but the roof line remains reasonable, which helps keep the center of gravity lower. The length of this means that you get a lot of cargo storage, and the family sedan width means that it feels maneuverable. And the height also means you don't need to be a giant to easily remove a kayak from the roof. Another compliment that's almost obligatory with the Subaru is the visibility, especially up front with this huge windshield and big windows. It's easy to drive, and if you buy one, you can also torment those closest to you with the same joke for years. Hey, where'd you park the Subaru? I didn't see it up front. Oh, I think I actually parked it out. Briefly, if you enjoy fun, detailed car content, consider subscribing and hitting the bell for notifications. Thank you. And with the price of the new Forester moving up three grand, I'd expect the same or maybe more with the upcoming Outback. I do think that Subaru will justify these costs with improvements, but they also might make it larger to better fit that price tag. So if this is enough vehicle for you, I'd strongly consider one now. As this sits, this is actually cheaper than an all-wheel drive RAV4 or Honda CRV and it's more comfortable and quiet with roughly the same amount of practicality and more off-road capability, which is actually another thing that I think makes this stand out. I've been calling it a wagon, but in reality, this is a lifted wagon. That kind of goofy looking cladding helps shield your Subi from rocks. Plus to keep you above obstacles, this has the same amount of ground clearance as a new Toyota Land Cruiser. Of course, this is never going to offer the same sort of angles or wheel articulation that that truck will, but it's impressive nonetheless. And you have a great full-time all-wheel drive system that does a good job of getting power to the rear. It can climb some obstacles or tame a snowy road, and to further assist, each Outback has X mode, which among other things, stops spinning wheels and sends torque to the side that needs it. It's essentially an easier solution to giving this thing proper locking diffs. If you're doing more than just some mild camping, I would recommend getting a wilderness trim, as that gets a nice suspension lift, bumpers with better clearance, mild all-terrain tires, a more durable interior, a more aggressive final drive ratio, a full-size spare tire, and stronger roof rails to better accommodate a large rooftop tent. Though if you go with the base one, I do really appreciate the swing out crossbars. That way you can deploy them when you need them, and when you don't, you can reduce a little bit of wind noise and put them back in. Moving to the inside, the Outback showcases a few more selling points. One, the feature list is extensive. Just skip the base and you have heated front seats, wireless CarPlay, and a lumbar adjustment for the driver. And at under 40 grand US, you can get leather, a power rear gate, heated seats in the rear, a heated steering wheel, and a reasonably crisp Harman Kardon sound system. My touring spec gives you soft Napa leather and ventilated front seats, but it's still utilitarian. The cargo area is reasonably wide, but quite long, especially when you fold down the rear seats. Even at six foot three, I think I could camp in the back of this. There's also standard seat releases back there, which are really helpful. Rear seat occupants will also have console vents, and plenty of leg and headroom. And the seats up front offer great support, especially for the driver of the limited and touring trims, as the cushion can actually extend out a few more inches. I think the seat bottom could maybe be softer to match the rest of the cushioning, but this is still a great highway companion, especially when you consider how much padding you're given for your elbows and even your knees. The car-like driving position also helps with this. The biggest drawback to the Outback is the tech. This was a low point in 2020, and since then, this has aged poorly. They did at least add wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. However, the icons are 
pretty small, making it a little hard to use in motion. The response time is slow. The partially embedded climate controls are at least laid out intuitively, but it forces you to interact with the screen even more. And the display's brightness and the angle of which it's positioned at can make it hard to read in direct sunlight. I'm sure Subaru will improve this for the next generation. And on the road, it feels like an elevated car. This means it doesn't feel bloated, so long as you're not pushing its cornering limits. It's a relaxing drive. It's soft. Body roll makes itself known quickly through corners. The steering is also numb, definitely has some vagueness on center, but it is quick, meaning that it really doesn't take very much effort to change direction. It remains planted no matter what the road surface looks like. And even more important, it's smooth and forgiving. The ride quality here is hard to match for the price. And at highway speeds, it's also still quiet, even more so than the new Forester that's more expensive. And my last bit of praise goes to the engine options. If you want to keep it simple and pay less, you can get a naturally aspirated 2.5 liter Boxer 4 paired up with a continuously variable transmission. It will drone, it doesn't really try hard to make you think it's something that it isn't, but it makes for smooth acceleration, good efficiency, and decent response. A lot of people who buy these don't really care if the 0 to 60 time is 9 seconds. But if you do want to pass with ease, even at high elevation, you can get the 2.4 liter turbocharged Boxer 4. In order to get this speed, you have to skip the lower trims, but what's that saying? You can't race a house, but a family of four can sleep in an Outback XT. The XT gets to 60 in under six seconds, though the response time with this setup keeps it from feeling too lively. What about the reliability? Well, the larger issues of Subaru's past are seldom reported. Initially, there was a recall on the PCM for turbo models, which could cause transmission failure, but the powertrain itself has been solid. If you do run into a problem with the engine, it will probably be the thermo control valve on the naturally aspirated models. Supposedly, this was fixed after 2022. To make things right, Subaru extended the warranty to 15 years and 150,000 miles for this part. Other things owners have had qualms with would be the eyesight driving aids cutting out, infotainment bugs, rapidly draining batteries, and easily cracking windshields. This comes from carcomplaints.com and NHTSA reports, with consumer reports backing up my findings. While the TCV issue is concerning, I wouldn't be afraid of buying an Outback, especially since this generation is now in its sixth model year. I might have fond feelings for this long Subaru, but there are drawbacks to the near gone sixth generation Outback. The biggest one to me is the tech that's aged almost as poorly as old movies with Diddy references. The EyeSight lane departure system bugs me constantly on small roads. It's also not too athletic. The turbo makes this thing surprisingly quick, but the response keeps it from ever feeling eager body rolls pronounced, the steering can be vague. If you are wanting something with any degree of driver engagement, this isn't it. Some of these aspects are things that Subaru has been improving upon with their latest redesigns. It is in need of an update. The problem is, with this update, we might be losing a lot of what has made the Outback an Outback. For as long as I can remember, it stood out for having its lifted wagon stature. And it's also been a great value compared to most all-wheel drive, mid-size-ish SUVs. Maybe the rumors aren't true. I'd love to see Subaru improve this while retaining its form factor and strong financial argument. What we have right now is still one of my go-to recommendations for value-minded people who want an extra degree of comfort and refinement and need versatility, yet don't really mind having dated tech or a ton of torque. Thanks for watching, and thank you to my channel members. I'll catch you in the next one. I think I actually parked it out. I've linked before.